Welcome to Brains and Machines, a deep dive into neuromorphic engineering and biologically inspired technology. In this episode, Dr. Chiara Bartolosi talks about her work putting neuromorphic technology into robots. Your hosts are Dr. Sonny Baines of University College London and Dr. Julia D'Angelo of Fortis in Munich. Welcome to Brains and Machines. I am Julia D'Angelo. And I'm Sunny Baines. In today's episode, Sunny will be talking robots with Dr. Chiara Bartolozzi of the Italian Institute of Technology. After the interview, we will be talking to Ralph Etienne Cummings from Johns Hopkins University about the issues raised. Thanks, Julia. Chiara leads a group developing analog subthreshold circuits to make bio-inspired brains for robots. She works extensively with the iCub, the Android robotic research platform, and her group focuses on exploiting information from event-driven vision and tactile sensors for cognitive tasks. You'll hear her talk about how neuromorphic technology can be used to implement attention mechanisms the importance of embodiment, and why it's important that we have a solid theory of how neural systems can work together to create intelligence. There are links to her work and some of the specific papers we'll be discussing on our website. You can check them out at brainsandmachines.net. I met Chiara at her lab in Genoa. Chiara Bartolozzi. Welcome to Brains and Machines. I wanted to start by asking you about your technical background. How did you get involved with this field? So I started with biomedical engineering, and I was interested in developing a technology that could be helpful for people. That's where my interest was, and then still is. And then during those years, I started having a look at neuroscience and something that was more related to biology rather than engineering, because that field was already multidisciplinary in that sense. And when I did my master thesis, I did it on a model of how we perceive the motion in depth. So the motion going uh, forward and backward with respect to us. And it was based on uh, the visual cortex, uh, models of cells, how to put them together in a hierarchy to obtain the perception of motion in depth. And then I wanted to spend some time abroad. And my thesis supervisor was friend with Giacomo Indiveri, who was doing something very similar, but using electronics. And when I heard him talking about his projects, I was really interested. And so I ended up in Zurich in his lab for a short project and then decided to stay there for my PhD. And again, it was a PhD in vision and trying to design chips that could replicate some of the behaviors that were seen. In that case, they were related to the attention mechanisms, what attracts the attention in vision so that we can then move our eyes and explore the scene around us. Can you tell me a little bit about why you moved specifically into robotics and embodied systems rather than just vision generally? So when I finished my PhD, I just did a small hacked system where I had one of the first DVS, one of the first silicon retinas from Toby and Patrick, and I had connected it to one of my chips. It was mounted on a small pan tilt unit, so a motor that could turn the camera, and it was turning following the interesting parts in the scene using just these two chips. And it was Right at the beginning of the field in event-driven vision, we had these sensors in the lab and the idea was, okay, these systems are cool when you want something that interacts with the real world in, in real time. It makes sense to use this technology when you want an autonomous system with very low power, very few components, very compact, can go around and do something smart in the world. And that is kind of natural fit to robotics. And I was lucky because when I finished in Zurich, they started running the IIT. And the first research lines that were here were in robotics. And one of the directors of the robotics was 
Giulio Sandini, and he's working a lot in bioinspired, in cognition. So he was interested in the neuromorphic domain. So I ended up doing a postdoc here with the humanoid robot ICAB with the idea of trying to exploit the neuromorphic technology to build better robots. Now, by the time this comes out, I think people listening to this podcast will understand very well what event-driven vision is, what DVS chips are. But just to clarify, this is where when these vision chips are looking at a scene, the only time a signal comes out is if something moves, if there's a change in illumination in one of the pixels, and then that will drive one of these spikes. And that's what does the sort of compression of what could be quite a large array into a low bandwidth signal that is easy to process and only focusing on the salient data. Would you agree with that way of describing them? Yes, I would say so. The big thing is that whenever there's no change, there's no data. And there's information there as well. If I don't see anything from the sensor, it means that the scene is as it was before. You came to Genoa, to the Italian Institute of Technology. You're working on eye cubs and you're trying to essentially put event-driven vision into these eye cubs, but that means those sensors need to be able to see things. You need to have processing that's going to look at primitives in the world and make sense of them. And that is a huge task. Now, I've been reading through a lot of your papers and this idea of taking this completely different way of thinking about data thinking about images, it seems to be just conceptually a very difficult task. Can you talk about how you approach that and how your group approaches that task? Yeah, so you nail it down. The point is we don't have images and the data that you get from these sensors is very different from what you get in traditional computer vision. And so the big question is how do we compute with these events? They contain a lot of information they discard redundancy, so there's something there. But the format and the way you get them is so different from traditional input images to computer vision or to models of the cortex that is done in neuroscience that the computation has to be done very differently. And that's what we explored in these years. We looked at very different ways to process the events. And I think there are two big extremes. One is, let's try to have a look at biology because the output of these sensors is loosely similar to what you would get from biological sensor. The retina does a lot more processing than the dynamic vision sensors, but still you have events, you have these digital pulses that you can think of as action potentials in the brain. The information is in the time in between the spikes and there's you know, evidence that also in the brain, the timing of spikes, action potentials is a way to convey information. So why not looking at the brain? So one branch of my research is looking at how the visual cortex processes these signals. We also can look at insects and we don't need to look just into mammalian systems. The other extreme is let's have a look at what computer vision did. There's a huge know-how there on how to extract information out of images. So let's see if there's something we can do with that know-how apply to event-driven vision output. So I think these are the two extremes. The idea is to still try to exploit the low latency, the information in the timing or the order of the events, but using some instruments that are very well consolidated. This brings up a really interesting question for me, which is about the top down and the bottom up, if you want to look at it that way. So you've got your sensors on the one hand, which are more biologically based or more biologically valid, if you want to call it that. You've got processors which are starting to emerge, neuromorphic processors which are able to deal directly with events, which are spike-based in themselves. These are being built. 
but you're in the middle, right? You're trying to integrate both of these sets of technologies. And it seems to me there must sometimes be a conflict because you just want the information out of the sensor and you want to use any kind of processor you can get hold of to do some of that processing. So there must often be a temptation to say, well, let's just get something that works on these events, whether it's a GPU or whatever, and we'll push till tomorrow <laughs> the problem of how we get that to work with a spike-based processor. Can you talk a little bit about the way that works for you and how you prioritize? Because I think that must be very hard. Yes. So in general, the things we do that are closer to computer vision, they run in software. And the idea there is to make something that works for the application that we have in mind. And that works in real time with the definition of robotic real time. That means you guarantee that the computation is done in a certain well-defined temporal window. And it doesn't take longer ever. So there, it's easier to use software and CPUs and GPUs and so on. For the brain-inspired spiking models that we use, the hope is to implement those on neuromorphic hardware. Now, the easiest thing is to still use GPUs, but frame the events in very short temporal windows so that it's as if you're sending spikes, but you're still sending a full image to a GPU because that's what they have been designed for. We really want to use the neuromorphic platforms because in that case, you can have the computation that is fully asynchronous as soon as you have enough spikes that travel in a hierarchy and the neurons accumulate enough information, they can propagate the signal and the computation is done very fast and with lower resources and so on. It's simply difficult to have a full system that has enough bandwidth and speed to communicate all the spikes in an online fashion. It's mostly a technical problem to hook up the system in a way that it works continuously online. So what we do is we work on the algorithm and Sometimes we manage to implement that algorithm on the neuromorphic platform. We did that for Spinacare. We are doing that for Loihi. We tried with Dynaps, but we have reached the point where we can demonstrate the architectures working there, but the full pipeline online with a full event-driven sensor at high resolution, it's still in the way. <laughs> So let me talk about one of the transition points. So presumably when you are designing your more vision processing kind of algorithms and using a GPU as a temporary staging post for this research, you must have principles in mind about how you design your algorithms so that they will be eventually compatible with your spiking processors. So it's two levels of complexity, right? The first level is how do you take the spiking data stream coming from your sensor and process that? But the second is how do you make that processing layer so that it's neuromorphic compatible and it's going to work with the spiking processors? Do you feel like you are clear about what you need to do in your software layer to make sure that you're producing neuromorphic compatible algorithms? So the easiest thing would be let's use neural models that we know are implemented or are implementable on neuromorphic hardware. The plain vanilla one is the leak integrating fire neuron and that's what most of us use. Now we know that on neuromorphic platforms, we can implement more complex neural models. It's true that if you want to design a system that can run on a neuromorphic chip, you have to know very well how that neuromorphic chip works. One example is the connectivity, the limits in what we call fan in and fan out. So the number of input synapses and output synapses that a neuron can have. These are limits or the precision of the synaptic values or if the synapses all have to share the same weight or each synapse can have a different weight. And each neuromorphic platform has different limitations and rules. 
And this is the difficult part when you are an user that is not so well informed, right? You, you really need to understand the hardware to be able to do it properly. And sometimes you might need, you know, a computational principle or a primitive that is not there. So you might need to either talk to the designer and say, okay, why don't you implement this with your circuits or develop the microcode in the digital platforms to program that. And these are different levels of complexity. I think what we advocate is the need for a solid theory. We have Boolean logic to use zeros and ones, the transistors as digital switches. And then with Boolean logic, you can build on top and basically build whatever computation you want. For neuromorphic, this theory is still being developed. It's still a matter of research. Also, when I want to have a system that learns, I look into computational neuroscience or to people developing these systems for doing training of networks. There are so many different ways to do that. And it's different from the deep learning field where you have a rule that you apply and that you somehow can build on. In our domain, there's still a lot of exploration. It seems to me that there is some kind of fundamental rule of engineering that you have to trade off efficiency against complexity somehow. Would you agree with that? Yes, and this goes to the question about which is the right level of abstraction. And I remember hearing the first discussion about that in my first Telluride. I think it was 2002. <laughs> and I was a first year PhD student there. And there were these big guys talking about what's the right level of abstraction? Should we model just the spiking behavior of the neuron using the leak integrate and fire? Or should we go down into modeling each single channel for the ions in the member of the neuron? And my approach is, let's see what we can do with a basic model and then find the limit. And when you have the limit, and you know that there is another computational primitive there that you can take and plug it in your system, put it there and understand which is the function that gives. So it's very pragmatic. And I think it's very important to understand what each thing that we observe in the brain and in neurons can give us functionally in terms of computation. And in a way, something we observe in the brain can be a byproduct of how the neurons are built, right? We have molecules, it's a living thing. It might be that something is there. It's not intended to do computation. It's just there because how, of how the thing is built. And maybe in silicon, we don't need to have that. But on the other side, someone who is very smart said that the brain had something and made the best use of what was there. So even these byproducts of how a neuron might work could be used for computation. And I think the interesting part is understanding the function of all these different parts. And now, you know, we are moving from the model of the point neuron to the model of the multi-compartment neuron and the dritic computation. And that's really cool, trying to understand what the dendrite does and how we could put it in computation and in chips. So I want to talk about robots and the challenges of actually having to build something into a machine that's then going to move as a result of what it's seeing. I know that there are real practical benefits to that in terms of understanding the science that doing everything in simulation is not good enough. Can you talk a bit about that? So I think it's difficult and interesting. So one thing that I didn't discuss when we were talking about vision is that vision as we are doing it now is disembodied and it's a very difficult problem. And so I think that we don't solve vision and then do our things. We solve something that is more complex, that is also putting action in the loop and not perception, output of a perception and then action. So if you put everything together in a body, I think this is going to simplify the problem. How? I don't know. <laughs> we started looking actually at exploration and active sensing exactly because 
when you have these event-driven vision sensors, but also event-driven tactile sensors, you really have to act. So unless you have a static camera and you're only interested in things that are moving, then you could be happy with that. But as soon as you start being interested in the scene, in what is static, you need to move the camera to see something. So how do we move the camera in a way that when you do processing, it's easier to extract information? And that's where I think robotics is interesting. It's not only I have a low latency, low power, autonomous thing that I can put in my robot and my robot can go very fast and interact with very fast objects. That's one side of the coin. The other side is I have a robot that I can use to simplify my vision problem, my perception problem. And the perception problem is not simply a perception problem, is I need to gather information to accomplish a task. So I think that's where we have to aim. Now that comes into the whole issue of attention. And I think that when you said earlier that you felt that somehow putting it into a robot will simplify the task, if you're only paying attention, as you say, to things to do that one task, then all of those sensor readings that you're getting from vision, from touch, because I know you're very interested in touch and do a lot of that here, they can all work together. And perhaps some of the clarification happens there, that you're getting fusion of things that are all relevant to that specific task and helping you get rid of what's irrelevant, redundant, which is one of the beauties of neuromorphic engineering anyway. Yeah, I agree. It's more complex because you have to integrate signals from different sensors and most probably from the actuation. But that, as I said, should simplify the problem at the end because you nail it down to what is significant to your task. Now we are working in attention, but it's not so much task related, it's more stimulus related. So what is in the stimulus that attracts my attention even before I understand the scene, even before I recognize that there is an object, something that is really bottom up. But that's the initial layer. And then you can build on top of that, adding the task and the top down context to it. So this is like the work you've done on affordances and identifying proto-objects that are in the foreground and so graspable and working out what the robot can interact with that's in its immediate environment before it even knows what kind of object it might be. Yeah, that goes along those lines. And I was lucky to meet Ernst Niebuhr in Telluride because we had this problem of, you know, we want to develop an attention system, but at the end, we always end up having the edge of the table as one of the most interesting part in the scene. Because with the cameras, you only see the edges of objects. You don't see the full colored item that might help you. And I said, yeah, but you know, there is this concept of the proto object. Even before you recognize or you segment an object, there are clues in the vision input that can tell you that there, there might be an object. And this is the concept of semi-close contour that you somehow recognize, feel that there's an object there. And yes, this is very salient and somehow it's already hardwired in the system because behaviorally it's salient where there is an object rather than some clutter around. And it could be salient that there is something closer because I can grasp it or something that is moving very fast, even if it's not so close, because it might be a threatening input. There's also that faces are really salient, even a few lines that might represent a face, even if it's not a real one. That is not yet in our system. We should find the model to incorporate that. But there is something that is already there and it's so hardwired that it belongs to this stimulus driven type of attention that is mostly driven by something that has a high contrast that is so different from all the rest. And then you can still tune the system to be more attentive to something that is far away if your task requires that. So I want to end on going back to a paper that you wrote where you talked about 
the things that were needed for neuromorphic robotics. And you had a number of calls to action in there about what you wanted to see from the neuromorphic community. And I wondered if you wanted to pick out one or two of those that you think are the most important in terms of helping the whole field to make progress, if you just had to choose one or at most two. I think we already touched on it, that is a strong theory, a way for me as a user to have rules that I can apply to solve a certain problem, a theoretical framework. There are a couple, the dynamic neural fields and the neuroengineering framework, but I think we need something more. And I think that's one of the big things. The other one is maybe that I don't like so much because I like the fact that there are a lot of different things around that one can pick up with trade-offs and pros and cons. But since there's no standard, the learning curve to learn how to use one of these systems not only use, but also really physically integrating and solving all the issues in streaming data in and out, so on. It requires a lot of effort. And if instead we could have, you know, a system that is a bit more abstract and a bit more independent on the specific platform we are using, I think this comes with the maturity of the field and the engineering effort that needs to be done. We should remember that we are all researchers. And even the companies that are involved there have their research parts involved rather than the engineering part. So, you know, it's not like the GPUs that there are millions sold and there are troops of engineers behind to solve all the problems and still there you find bugs, right? I think that's one of the big things that would boost the application. Having tools that are stable and easy to use. Chiara Bartolozzi, thanks so much for coming on to Brains and Machines. Thanks, Sunny. Thanks, Sunny, and thanks for this amazing interview. So for more about Chiara's work, please go to brainsandmachines.net. Now we welcome back our regular commentator, Professor Raul Fetian Cummings from Johns Hopkins University. Hello, Julia. Hello, Sunny. Happy to be back with you again. Hi, guys. So I loved this episode, and I'm a bit biased, let's say. Chiara and I have done the master thesis with the same professor in Genoa, who brought us both into neuromorphic. So she really worked on a lot of things, optic flow, even driven tracking, ego motion, synaptic dynamics, and she started researching uh, the very first neuromorphic humanoid at IIT. And she's now focused on tactile, and we said it already with Simeon. There is one beautiful paper that I'd like to mention from 2006, which is with Giacomo Indiveri. That work implements building blocks for a multi-chip neuromorphic where salient sub-regions of the input stimuli are serially processed, while non-salient regions are suppressed. I guess in that moment, attention was an interesting topic. And nowadays, we don't really have any attention system on neuromorphic platforms. My question is, is it really too difficult as a model to have it on the neuromorphic platform or it just got lost as a topic? I think there's a couple of things that happens, right? If you look at the full multi-sensory input, if you will, um, attention models, that includes you know, orientation, that includes color, that includes intensity and motion. And then you look at all the layers of processing that happens afterwards until you get to the point where you have a saliency map. That's quite complicated and therefore a little bit difficult to implement on any platform because it's just going to take a lot of neurons, right? Now, I will point out that Jamal Mullen, when he was in my lab, and this has been published in uh, IEEE journals, he did implement a version of it that was much more reduced, right? So instead of dealing with large images, you dealt with smaller images and were able to show the same kind of saliency map construction that you would see in the big model. Now, that aside, it's still a very complicated model. So, then you say, what are the various pieces that form the saliency model, and then what can be implemented easily? That's where I think the DVS, the dynamic vision systems, and other event-based images comes into play, where there you're only looking at motion changes. 
And because of that, you are able to use motion as the key input to a saliency model. And that can be quite effective, but it does not, of course, capture the red ball on the green background, for example, right? So as you add new features, more complicated features, then it's going to get more and more complicated, and therefore we would need more complex platforms to implement it. And now we can use this episode to talk about proto-objects. Why did you guys start it looking at border ownership cells at first and not something else? So that's because, you know, Rudy van der Heidt recorded from these cells in V4, then V2, excuse me, where he basically found these cells to have a response that tracked closure of objects, right? He didn't care whether you were seeing a transition from a light background to a dark object or a dark background to a light object. The question was, where does closure happen relative to the surface of interest? And border ownership is what allows this to happen. So there's competition that happens between two cells, one that's trying to say, no, 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 the closure is to the left. The other is saying, no, 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 the closure is to the right. And that competition is fed by the inputs that comes from a closed surface. So based on that, and based on the recordings that he had from Monkey, we were able to say, well, this is how potentially you could use border ownership as a means to construct a grouping of border cells that would then give you the medial axis of an object. And from there, that medial axis then becomes the primary object marker, the proto-object marker, that then becomes ultimately the final object that you are looking for. But that's how it basically started. It started from biologists to hear um, Rudy van der Heide seeing some very interesting recordings on this relationship between different cells at borders of objects and then how one can model that. And this is you know, work that Rudy did with Ernst, with Stefan Mihalis, and we came in more on the modeling side, right? That's where Russell and company comes in. Which is crazy to think that this already the gestaltism in 1950, and then they found the cells in V2 in 2000, and it's really interesting. I have a, another question, if I may. And Chiara mentioned the fact that the retina does a lot more processing than the dynamic vision sensors. So I have a problem here because most of the time that I try to use the even driven cameras and I model them and I try to create layers, I do not know where to put them. So I wonder how can we use them and which kind of level of abstraction? And the second question is, do we need more processing already at the cameras? And in my point of view, is. Uh, very much, yes. <laughs> but I want to know what you think, guys. Yeah, by all means, right? I think the current DVS is essentially just one path, right? Through a photoreceptor all the way through to a ganglion cell. And the output is basically spikes. There's no lateral interaction. Even the contrast is being done internally in time, right? Changes among itself. No lateral interactions means you don't know anything about changes, edges. You don't know anything about closures, like what we just talked about in terms of proto-object border cells. None of that exists, right? So it'd be wonderful if we could implant that, if you will, into a, the next generation of the DVSs and the ATCs of the world that has that kind of interaction. Hey, so I know I've talked about this before, but I wanted to mention the fact, again, that I mourn the passing of the CNN meaning cellular neural network rather than convolutional neural network. These were really amazing devices from the late 90s. Essentially, you had an array of uniform cells, uniform in that each one was configured in the same way, but they had incoming and outgoing connections from each one, from each of the nearest neighbors that could be different. And the whole thing was programmable digitally. You could do all sorts of really interesting image processing operations, including, if I remember correctly, Laplace transformations at orders of magnitude faster than you could normally do them. And the beauty of it is, of course, that with a processor like this, you're keeping the geometry of the image intact. You're not having to break your image, which is a geometrical construct into long lines of numbers, process them, and then put them back together again. It's all processed with the geometry in which it was captured. Whenever I complain about neuromorphic cameras, these are the things I'm yearning for. Things that are biologically plausible, 
but in a different way from, for instance, DVS cameras. Yeah, and you have, of course, the work of Piotr Dudek from Manchester, who also had his. Even going back to Misha's original retina, that also had interactions laterally and so on, right? So ultimately, yeah, that's one thing that we don't have, but I think we've been influenced by the imaging industry, right? Making pretty pictures. That has been one of the drivers behind these cameras. But ultimately, these are computational sensors. They're not cameras. So if we look at it from that perspective, then we really don't care about pretty pictures. We care about keeping information that is relevant to computing later on. And once we get to that kind of mindset, then we'll see more, I think, of these interactions horizontally and various derivatives and so on in computed on the chip. Did you want to say any more about active vision, Ralph? I know that was something you were thinking about. Yeah, so Chiara mentions it. There's a loop that by simply moving and, and then collecting information, visual information during the move, then you can change the data that you collect to be more simple for the task at hand, right? Because essentially it's almost like a coordinate transform, right? You match the new manifold to the task at hand. I wanted to put that in the context of what folks were doing back in the 80s, right? So Rujina Baichi, who is one of the most important, most influential computer visionists, basically started this notion of active vision. She published his 1988 paper uh, where she talks about exactly this issue and then bringing in controls and how controls plays a role in terms of how you navigate the world and what information you collect and how that makes it simpler to do analysis of what you see and to focus attention on particular objects as you are navigating around the world. And then, of course, there was the work of Dana Ballard. There was the work of Yanis Alamonos, right? I mean, he also has done a lot of work on understanding active vision and how it all plays a role. And I think now we are, in some way, reinventing the wheel, but now the wheel is slightly different. It's an event-based wheel <laughs> as opposed to a continuous frame-based wheel. That's one of the big differences. All these folks back in the day looking at frames. Now we are looking at active vision from the perspective of event-driven image sensors and images, which brings its own complexities, but its own elegance in terms of how you can extract information that you need. So I think that's essentially the future. I just finished reading a book I've had sitting on my shelf for years called How the Body Shapes the Way We Think, A New View of Intelligence by Rolf Pfeiffer and Josh Bongard. I remember Rolf from back in the 2000s when I was going to a lot of robotics conferences. His robots were reactive, but unlike the robots created by Rod Brooks and some others at the time, that reactivity was much more about fast physical control loops and less to do with algorithms. Let the physics do the computation, that kind of thing. The book is old. It came out in something like 2006, and it had a foreword by Rod Brooks, which is maybe not surprising. But actually, I felt it stood up very well to the passage of time. He talks a lot, or they talk a lot, about the fact that vision and other sensing tasks actually become easier in the presence of constraints and with the addition of, for instance, movement than they are if everything is static. And they point out ways in which the physics of actuators allow them to become their own sensors so that the stretch is actually telling you something about the way the motor or the, the leg is moving. So I actually know about Rolf Pfeiffer because of Matei Hoffman. The first time that I heard about embodiment and sensory motor contingency theories is from Matei Hoffman in Prague. And he was actually working with Pfeiffer, if I'm not mistaken, and they were working on a quadruped that was walking on different terrains using sensory motor contingency theory. And it was actually saying what you said, that is making it easier if you have a, an active loop. And another thing that I'd like to mention, if I may, is that Chiara has been very elegant, but I can be a little bit more brutal. And it's a mess <laughs> to try to have a fully bio-inspired pipeline. And we tried a lot to have a full bio-inspired pipeline. And when I say this, is having a biologically plausible model, then you have the even-driven cameras, then you use the neuromorphic platform, then you try to bridge, or this is what I 
used to writing my papers, to bridge the gap between software and hardware, having everything by Inspired. And I say we try to stick with the by Inspired pipeline because I have done the PhD with Chiara, for the people that do not know it. And the question for you guys is, how much is important for you to have a full by Inspired architecture? Because for me, it's really important, but I want to know your opinion on this. For me, I've always been a hybridist, if you will, right? I've never been a fully believer in the immediate orthodoxy that it has to be fully bio-inspired and fully hardware for it to be real. So I come from that perspective, right? So I think that we should use approaches that is relevant to the task, that makes the task easier, that makes the task doable, right? Ultimately, the assumption is that as hardware develops, as the understanding and ability develops as well, we'll probably like migrate more and more and more and more towards a more biomorphic implementation. But for now, I am not married to that whatsoever. You pick the pieces that works for you along the way. It allows us to have that balance between what Sunny refers to as the complexity versus efficiency dilemma, right? So at some point, you will have to decide, do you make your models simpler in order to get efficiency, or do you make your model more complex, but then you pay a price on efficiency? So that also brings us to one of the things that Chiara talked about, which is this notion of building your models piecewise, right? You start with the most basic, you complete the bounds of what that most basic model can provide you, then you add the next layer to give you a little bit more dynamicity and complexity. So that's what I was referring to as incremental constructionism, right? So you start with a, you know, the most basic models and you start adding layers upon it, right? And Chiara talks as well about the fact that going towards non-point neurons, going towards dendritic uh, computation and so on, and all of that is essentially building that complexity. So ultimately then, what I'm saying is that I am not married to the full biomorphic pipeline. I think you just pick the pieces that makes it work efficiently at the places that it does. So I'd like to look at this from a slightly different point of view. The development of robot models of lower animals is really interesting. I've been to visit Auki Eisbert at the EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland a couple of times, and he has these lovely, I think it's lamprey robots that implement neural models. He's run them on Spinnaker and is working on incorporating other types of neuromorphic hardware, if I remember correctly. The point is that I do wonder whether there's a sort of top down and bottom up thing going on here, where the bottom up thing might be starting with very small, relatively simple organisms and making them more biologically inspired. And maybe we can handle that on a low level and build up from that a little bit more and learn some lessons. Whereas where you have real advanced tasks like the ones you're talking about, you can just or you have to just grab any technology that will do the job that you're having trouble doing, and that gets you to the hybrid approach. Essentially, I think all these approaches can coexist, and hopefully that you'll learn different lessons by following the different approaches. I think at the end of the day, even the most simple organism, as you're saying, is hard to model, right? So you think about the C. elegans, which we know every single neuron, <laughs> yet, we don't have the ability to implement whatever, 306 neurons, to implement a model of a C. elegant that actually behaves the way a real C. elegant does, right? So this notion of reducing it to the point where we can implement everything about it, I think is maybe a little bit fallacy because we cannot really implement all the aspects of it. So again, we just pick the pieces that we can, right? And then from there, we build upon it and add more and more complexities. So Josh Bungard, when I met him, he was basically using I think with genetic algorithms, it might have been some other type of algorithms, but it was essentially growing embodiments that would actually have particular capabilities to climb or to walk or to do different tasks by simply growing limbs, growing hearts, growing segments, and so on. And that was the research that he was doing at the time. And, and this falls again back to this incremental constructionism, right? You start with the simplest two points, stick, kind of figure and then you add additional springs and you add, you know, ability to jump and so on. And that gives that particular organism the ability to jump from a floor to a table and so on and so forth, right? So learning can play a role in that. And development, so how do you develop new embodiment based on the tasks 
that is not limited by what we see. You know, it's not humanoid or it's not insectoid, but it's something completely different that can solve a particular task that is of interest. That I think is really interesting. And Josh did a lot of work on that, if I remember correctly. That's it for another episode. Thanks to Sunny for another interesting interview and Ralph for helping us put it all into context. In our next episode, Sunny will be talking about algorithms with Professor Emre Nefci of the Peter Grunberg Institute at the Ulick Research Center in Germany. We hope you join us then. That brings another episode of EE Times Current to a close. Thank you for listening, and thanks again to our guest, Dr. Chiara Bartolozzi. EE Times Current is available through all the major podcast platforms, but if you reach us at our website, eetimes.com, you'll find a transcript of this episode along with other resources. EE Times Current is produced by EE Times. It was engineered by Greg McRae and Taylor Marvin at Coop Studios in Boulder, Colorado. The segment producer was Stephanie Munoz. I'm Eric Singer. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.